this is um, this is Van Gogh, a robot which is um, painting, painting with disappearing paint, or rather water, on some specially treated paper that um, that turns black when it's wet. At the same time, it's um, some music based on box preludes and fugues. The music is, I took the 24 preludes and fugues and made uh, probability distributions of each piece and substituted each note with a note that was equally likely given those probability distributions. So statistically speaking, this is the, this is the music that Bach never wrote switch back and forth between, we can switch back and forth between, you know, shadows of things that were, it's kind of a subtle difference, and shadows of things that might have been, and over here on the canvas, the motions of the brush are represented as probability curves, there's a certain likelihood it's, I call it fake intelligence because it's really not smart at all. It's uh, or fake creativity rather than artificial and gives the right idea because it's, it only looks like it's smart. It really isn't. It has no memory, no expectations of the future, no high level representation. All it has is probability curves. So at each moment, there's a certain likelihood that it'll do one thing or another. Now, it just happens that Paintings are made by brush motions, and things that are really abstract that do not have represent that do not represent have um, there are certain classes of them which look similar to human beings, and the similarity, the sort of the characteristics of a given texture, can be represented statistically. So whether or not it was created by some conscious um, thinking, feeling entity, or a glacier, or a, or a river, or, or a piece of tree bark or something, it will have a characteristic signature which can be represented statistically. One advantage of using the machine is that hopefully it, it will allow me or someone using it to effortlessly produce a vast quantity of work and you could s simply sweep through all the parameters and you know just labor on providing it feeding it with materials and it eventually will paint every possible painting the production of images could be a uh, an exhaustively it could be complete at some date you know what's sad what's sad is when a guy who paints by throwing paint out of a bucket has a creative block that's like, because each one of these are like my severed limbs, my lost children. It's excruciatingly painful for me to sit here and watch the machine paint. <laughs> Step one, sit in the chair and press the red button on the timer in a relaxed and confident manner. Fiddle with the knobs on the control box, okay? Well, this is, this is the G-Force chair, which will align and straighten all of your airing corpuscles. Here we go, the low range. <laughs> okay. Okay, now, now. This, this was formerly the head positioner from a, from a large hard disk drive. It's kind of an amazing, amazing component. Let's turn this down here. It, uh, it has a frequency response beyond the audio range, so it's, it, can, it can push you faster than you can hear it. Uh, this was formerly some crutches, I don't know, various things put together. 
Why, my initial intent was to make a nausea chair. I'd, I've always heard about the vomit tones, these certain frequencies that, that if you're subjected to them, it causes you to void you know, your bowels uncontrollably, which really excited me to hear about this. And so I said right about it. Unfortunately, it, it's, it's simply exhilarating and somewhat drug-like to sit in this thing. Although well, some people have uncontrollable laughing fits when they're in it. <laughs> certain frequencies, it's hard to breathe. Each, uh, each organ of the body has a unique resonant frequency. So when, um, for instance, they design ejector seats, they have to make sure that it doesn't, you know, shake your body at specific frequencies. Whereas here we are attempting just the opposite, to, to try and stimulate each organ. <laughs> Let's, I like that music you guys were playing earlier. I'll see if I can. I'll see if I can remember that. If, I'll see if I can remember that piece. Something like that. This is the flying fan, and uh, initially when I tried it out, I was um, I was just feeling giddy and hung this thing from the ceiling and gave it a push and it started flying around and I expected it to, to crash a lot sooner than it actually did. So then, uh, of course, not content, I equipped it with all modern amenities such as toilet paper and. Uh, Something I've, I've been wanting to try out. I have a theory that if I stand in the middle of it, it's going to turn me into a turn me into a mummy. So here we go. <laughs> well, it's trying. It's trying. Let's see, this is veggie darts, which is an inversion of the traditional game of darts, topologically speaking. It's the carrots. Are paled on these pins. Like everything else in the show, it had a full and eventful life before it was it was uh, adapted to this use. It was uh, originally a backplane from some uh, Data General computer. All the pins are gold plated. <laughs> Carrots came from Haymarket. The woman who sold me the carrots started to, when I told her what the carrots were for, she started suggesting all kinds of different vegetables. So, here we have this thing that might or might not be alive. It's in here in some kind of a life support system and it's controlled in some way by a computer. As we are. We do have a computer which does a few things. It, um, it disables the switch so that the creature can recover. It uh, keeps track of how many times the button's been pushed and what kind of a state the creature is in. And uh, to me, it's kind of interesting. It's, I mean, this is, it, it is, it is interactive in the, in the, in the case that there's a, there's a direct and immediate feedback loop, which is something that's often missing from things that claim to be interactive. But here it's present. You, you push a button, something happens immediately, and you see it. So when this happens, you push the button as many times as you want the thing to occur. Now, it's just like, uh, you know, here we are in our Skinner box, and we're being rewarded by a grotesque spectacle. And so we push it, we were, you know, it's, I forget, it's a one-to-one -one reinforcement schedule. So I was thinking, I, I've been thinking a lot about, um, about death, and what is death, and what is, you know, death and not death, and when does life become death, and human, and what does it mean to be human, and how human is a chicken, and, and how human is a fetus, and which should have more rights. And when you're dead, at what point are you dead? And who gets to decide? And in actual practice, I mean, I've, I've seen people die, and it's not at all like you would expect it to be. It's not like in the movies. There's no theme music. Sometimes it's sunny out. The people who are around you, chances are they see, you know, 20 people die every day. And they've got their own humor for dealing with the situation. Maybe there aren't enough beds. Healthcare ration. It's a fact. 